got on the show today. Julian Nagelsmann, will he be Manchester United's next manager? It's looking quite likely if Eric Ten Hag goes that he could be the number one candidate. Going to get into that. Also, Ahmad Diallo, potential summer exit. Would you want Ahmad to leave the football club? Is it a mistake to let Ahmad go? We're going to talk about that. Ivan Tony price set. There's been a lot of different prices being talked about. We're going to discuss Ivan Tony. I've got a different opinion to Mark on this and I want to get into it with you guys. And also as well, Jeremy Frimpong, how could I forget about that? Somebody that we've been linked to a lot over the last two years. 34 million release clause in the summer. Manchester United are very attracted to Frimpong, but will we be able to get him because of all the other positions that are high priority for us on the list in the summer? Welcome everybody to the morning show. Straight off the bat, I want to get in with a poll. Ahmad Diallo, would you want, would you let him leave in the summer? Would you let Ahmad Diallo leave in the summer? Get in your votes because I know Ahmad's very well liked within the fan base. I really like Ahmad. I think it's a disgrace that he's not had more minutes this season. I don't know what he's doing wrong behind the scenes. Eric Ten Hag seems very keen to give you for chance. And Ahmad Diallo just doesn't seem to be getting anything out of him. And, you know, he wanted to go on loan in January. Ten Hag stopped it from happening, told him he was going to be an important player and hasn't used him. So if I was Ahmad, I'd probably look, be looking for an exit too. But get in, the, get in the poll down below. Would you want Ahmad to leave in the summer? Should we cash in or should we keep him? But let's get in to... Let's get into the starting news. And I know a lot of people about the manager situation is either like, we're either keeping Ten Hag or we're letting him go. Ineos need to decide and they need to pick one. And I'm in the same boat as well. I'm I'm really up in the air on this at the minute because obviously I've said it uh, multiple times on the show. If it was down to me, I would be keeping Eric Ten Hag for another year. Ineos aren't completely set on Eric Ten Hag and it's up in the air at the moment whether they're going to change or whether they're going to stick with him. And it's up on the air on a lot of different factors. One, because of the price of getting managers out of the jobs. And two, because a lot of managers are looking at, I mean, Southgate and Nagelsmann, in the Euros this summer. So when would they be able to come in? It's a very sticky situation for Manchester United right now. But the fact of the matter is, Ten Hag's job isn't safe. He could still be here, but there is a very big likelihood that they also could change the manager as well. So we have to talk about who the next manager of Manchester United would be, because it's huge. It's absolutely huge. It's the new era. It's the Ineos 25% ownership, it's the new structure, it's the Omar Barada, it's the Dan Ashworth. Got a bit of an update on that as well. It's the complete new era and we don't know whether Eric Ten Hag is going to lead that or we don't know who the next manager is going to be. And if they do make a change, it's super, super, super important that they pick the right candidate. Massively important. Like I said the other day on my show, they've done well with getting Omar Barada in, they've done well with getting Dan Ashworth in, Jason Wilcox looks like a good appointment, they're going to get ahead of recruitment, but you ruin that completely, like by getting Southgate in. Like you ruin it completely. It's like going on an all inclusive holiday to Mexico and it just thunderstorms the whole time. Like it completely ruins it. So we've got to get the right candidate in. And it's come out recently that Julian Nagelsmann could be the top candidate for Manchester United to go for in the summer. Now, Sam, who works with the United Stand, uh, is an up-and-coming journalist who is doing brilliantly well, got an inside scoop on this, on, on the Nagelsmann story, and is ran it by quite a few different sources. And I was speaking to him this morning, and it's emerging that Julian Nagelsmann could be the top candidate for Manchester United in the summer. Now, get in the chat what you think about this. I've always said... Personally, even though I would keep Ten Hag, if we were going to make a change this summer, Nagelsmann would be the guy I'd go for. Young coach, progressive coach, passionate on the sidelines, speaks really well. I mean, I, I think when he was um, early on in his career, he, he had so many plaudits and so many people wanted him to, to, to go on and, 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 and go to their club. You know, to top clubs in the Premier League looking at Nagelsmann as being the next, the next big coach. He went to Bayern Munich and it did, sadly, not go not go the right way for him. It wasn't a disaster, by the way. What's happening with Tuchel right now is a disaster. It wasn't a disaster, but it didn't... For, for Bayern Munich standards, it didn't go the way that, 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 that they wanted it to go. That doesn't mean he's a bad coach. I think he's a very good coach. I think what he's doing with Germany is very good as well. Considering where Germany were at, and if you look at the last few results of Germany... Julian Nagelsmann is doing very well with him. He's a good coach. I really do like him and I think he's got a lot of prospects. 
So if we were to change the manager, I think he's the only one currently on the market that I would actually be like, if Ineos went out and got him, I'd be like, you know what, this is serious. He's a serious coach coming in. I can get on board with this. I actually am a big fan of Nagelsmann. So that makes sense there. But I want to tell you the actual news that we've got coming out on this and what's coming from Sam, because he gave me a little bit more detail on his report. And he said... This is his first source. Ineos haven't made any moves yet, but Nagelsmann has instructed his agent to turn down any offers from other clubs without specifying a deadline. So it did come out that Nagelsmann wants his job secure after the Euro so he can go straight into it. From our source, it's coming out that he's told his agent to turn down any other clubs because he's not set a deadline yet. And this is because I think, I mean... I think Man United would want to go for Nagelsmann, but they're not sure whether they're actually going to let go of Ten Hag yet, so everything's kind of up in the air. Now, the second source says, it wouldn't surprise me, I was told weeks ago to put money on Nagelsmann. He ticks all the boxes. Needless to say, he's also free. So all of this, you know, 15 million to get De Zerbi out of Brighton, that is a fee that we can't afford to spend. Money that you have to pay out of managers for compensation. With Nagelsmann, you don't have to do that because his contract is up with Germany. He can either extend with Germany or he can move on to another club for free. That ticks a huge box for Ineos. That ticks a huge box for Manchester United because we're on a tight budget as it is. Manchester United can't afford to go out there splashing you know, 15 million on release clauses as well as paying Eric Ten Hag out. We've got financial play, a financial fair play, and we've got a big summer that we've got to get our priority targets in and we're going to be on a tight budget. So the fact that Neil Guzman's free is another huge bonus to Ineos and, and, and to the structure at Manchester United when looking at another manager. But also as well, Neil Guzman has been linked with a lot of clubs and he instantly shuts it down. He's never once made a comment on Manchester United links, neither confirming or denying. I don't think that they have 100% decided to sack Eric Ten Hag, but I do think that if they do, Neil Guzman is a top target. He's, I, I, I agree with this. I think he's a progressive coach. He's an attacking coach. He's somebody that can work with a structure like Ineos and he's free. I think it makes sense. And let me tell you now, if we're in a situation where Gareth Southgate and Julian Nagelsmann are the top targets, oh my lord, it is absolute tunnel vision to Nagelsmann. There is no way on earth that a competent board of top professionals that Ineos have appointed come to the conclusion to go to Ga for Gareth Southgate over Julian Nagelsmann. So it's actually, even though I do want Eric Ten Hag to stay and I want him to see out the last year of his contract, I want to give him a chance. If we do make the change, I mean, I can't stop Ineos from doing it. And I think if they do decide to do that, that's their decision. You can understand based on what Ten Hag has achieved this season. There's multiple reasons why I would stick with Ten Hag, but we've spoken about them until I'm blue in the face. But Ineos... If they do decide to make the decision, Nagelsmann's the best guy they can go for. So I have to get on board with it if they do do that. So the fact that Nagelsmann reports are coming out, and I trust Sam implicitly, I think he's brilliant. The fact that these are coming out now, in a way, I'm happy about because I was so, so nervous and, and frightened that Southgate was the guy we'd go for if, if Ten Hag left. Now the reports are coming out about Nagelsmann, it makes me more comfortable that if Ten Hag does depart, we'd actually have a good coach coming in to take over. Get in the comment what you would think. Nagelsmann would love Sancho, Sancho FC, absolutely loving it. Player Power FC, I mean, that's the thing. You know, I've said I want to stick with Ten Hag and I want to do a mass, a mass audit of the squad this summer and a ruthless exit of the squad. But... The fact of the matter is, Ineos might sack the manager. And if they do sack the manager, we need to make sure that there's a good replacement coming in because there's an option where we sack Ten Hag and then we get Southgate in and that would be an absolute disaster. But there is an option there that we sack Ten Hag and we get Nagelsmann in. That's the best option that we have right now. That is the best option that we have. My option would be to keep Eric Ten Hag, carry on with the process, give him a chance under the new board. If it works out, brilliant. If it doesn't, then you make a change. It's not as if we've been winning stuff for the last five years and this is an absolute drop-off. Like We have been underperforming for the last decade, over a decade now. So sticking with Eric Ten Hag for one more year and giving him a chance, I see, is suitable. Other people don't. I can understand where people are coming from. 
as Dick Van Hal, but Nagelsmann is the best guy to get if we don't. But the only thing with, is with Nagelsmann, when does he come in? You know, you've got the Euros, then he's got to take a holiday. Like, we've got a pre-season tour, who's going to be heading up that? There's a lot of questions to be asked about how it would work. Um, get your votes in, in the poll. Going to move into that in a second as well. Just talking about the manager as of now. Tom Edwards says, when you stack it up, Ange Postacoglu is a logical option. Just need to commit the funds. <sighs> Ange, I think, is a great prospect of a manager, but there's no way that we're going for him. And he's, he's at Spurs right now, so it won't be Ange Postacoglu. Spencer Silvertower says, do a poll on Nagelsmann or Ten Hag. We'll definitely do that in a second. So would you let Ahmad leave in the summer? Let me vote on this. I would say no. Let me see what you guys would say. The poll isn't working for me, so if the producer can tell me the results, that would be lovely. And then we'll get the poll set up on Nagelsmann or Eric Ten Hag as well. But quickly want to touch on, quickly, 72% say they wouldn't sell Ahmad. This is the thing. If Ten Hag is still manager in the summer, Ahmad probably leaves. If a new manager comes in, Ahmad probably stays. Player FC, people that are into the, the, the player side of things, these are things that you've got to take into account. If Nagelsmann comes in in the summer, Sancho probably stays. These are things that you've got to take into account. If Eric Ten Hag stays, absolutely Sancho leaves. So there's multiple different factors. People that are Player FC, I've never understood it. But the fact of the matter is, what I can appreciate is good talents. Sancho, I think, sh should leave. But Ahmad, I actually think, is a really good talent there that I'd like to see progress. Ultimately, though, me personally, it all lies with the manager. And you have to trust the manager. There's things I massively disagree with Eric Ten Hag on, and Ahmad is, is one of them. But you've got to trust the manager if you're behind him. So get in the chat what you would want. And let's run the poll on coming in to next season. Who would you want as manager? Eric Ten Hag or Julian Nagelsmann? Let's get that poll going and see what you guys think. And quickly, on the Nagelsmann story as well, whilst you're voting in that poll. I've been thinking about it a little bit. So the Euros run, if I'm not mistaken, from the 15th of June to the 15th of July. So Nagelsmann absolutely, categorically, is going to be managing Germany in the Euros. He might get to the final, he might what not. But you'd think that Germany are at least going to get through to the last stages. You'd think they're at least going to get through until, like, you know, 8th, 9th of July, that sort of stage. That's just me thinking off the top of my head. I don't actually know when the quarters and the semis are, but I know it runs between that month. You'd think that they're going to get through until at least the July stages. Then Nagelsmann finishes. Then he goes on a holiday. So the pre-season tour for Manchester United, I think it starts on like the 16th of July or the 15th of July in Norway. So he's not going to be there for the pre-season tour with all the players. So already you're starting off on the back foot. You've not got time to work with the players. You've not got time to put your, to put your philosophy down, you know, train the way that you want to train in pre-season. I know that a lot of the experienced players will also be on holiday as well. But still, you'd want your coach to be in. You'd want the coach to be already working. And second of all, what about transfers? You know, the transfer window opens in June. Julian Nagelsmann, is he going to be coaching Germany whilst also talking to Omar Barada and Jason Wilcox about who he wants to come into Manchester United? Now, I know that Ineos wants a team that heads up the transfers themselves and the coach obviously is going to have a say on that and, and, and they're going to talk about it but mainly the recruitment team is going to do transfers I know that's the model that they want to go down and Ten Hag has already the reports have already come out that Ten Hag's happy to give up a bit of control with you know a stable and proper recruitment team behind him so Julian Nagelsmann I think would more than welcome you know a recruitment team doing the majority of the work but that happens at most clubs but he absolutely, and, and he absolutely should, and the manager should absolutely have a say on what players they want, the priority positions, who they would want for them positions, and they should be in constant conversation. So transfers, are they only going to start, you know, after the Euros? And, and, and even then, like, have we going to be, have, will we have done any planning into who we're going to go down? Is Ineos just going to completely head up the transfers themselves and Julian Nagelsmann comes in and, you're working with this for now. You can have more say in the next window. This is what you've got. How is it going to work? That's the only thing that I would I would think of going for Nagelsmann, even though he's my number one choice. This summer's an absolute write-off. First of all, you've not got Dan Ashworth in as your sporting director, which was crucial. 
Second of all, Julie Nagelsmann doesn't come in in, in time to properly head up transfers and, and kind of talk to the recruitment team about what transfers he wants. He doesn't have time to evaluate the squad. And, and he comes in not even for the start of pre-season and doesn't have as much time to prepare for the start of the Premier League. This summer is would be ill-prepared, it would be a mess and it, you'd have to just put it on the back burner and say, you're in now, Nergelsman, next summer we're going to go for it with you. But that's the, they're all the questions that I'd want answering and that's not for me to say. I think Nagelsmann is the right guy if Ten Hag leaves. I think the recruitment team we're building is elite. I think the, the, the team behind the manager we're building is elite and it's a breath of fresh air. But this summer would be a write-off, there's no doubt about it. And it would be worrying kind of going into the summer with, you know, the, no manager because he's, he's at the Euros and you're at a point as well where you don't even know what transfers you're going for and you don't know who is dealing with the transfers. I mean, you'd, we've been told it'll be Omar Barada, Jason Wilcox and, and Hargreaves doing it, but it's Matt Hargreaves, but it's a situation where it's a lot of the unknown for Manchester United going into the summer and I would be worried about who we're going to bring in, are we going to waste the money, is the coach going to have much say, when is the coach going to get to work with the players, um, are we going to start off on the back foot again, which you'd assume that we would because of the the time that it takes to get Neil Gussman into the job. So get in the comments what you think about that. Um, let's see what you're saying in terms of who would you want as the United manager next season. I'm going to have my vote on that, get in the comments who you would want. So still, we've got just over 1,200 votes coming in. Keep your votes coming. I'm surprised at that, you know. I really am surprised. 75% of the chat are still backing Eric Ten Hag. And it's nice to see that. It's nice to see that, you know, the community can see through the fact that this has happened so many times at the club before of sacking a manager, the players continue and it's a cycle. And I'm not saying it's all down to the players because it's not. It's a different group of players that were here to when, you know, Mourinho and Van Gaal were here. I mean, there's some of the same faces, but Ten Hag has had recruitment. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying you need time within a process. And I think a lot of people are, are seeing that Eric Ten Hag has had, I think it's 64 injuries this season. He's integrated the youth really well. There's positives to say about Eric Ten Hag. There is a style of play there. It's just not working. And people want to see him get given the time and at least get given a shot under the new structure and it might not work out I could hold my hands up and say it might not there's a lot of things that he's done this season that kind of do make me question and do worry me but I do think he's at least, he should at least get a chance under the new structure and it's and it, you can see that a lot of you guys think that as well I'm surprised it's 75% because I know Julian Nagelsmann is a very popular name too and I think he's a lot of people's first choice if Ten Hag departs so people are still team Eric Ten Hag right now interesting to see if that will change after the Bournemouth game I think the Bournemouth game we say this every week but it's an absolute must win for Eric Ten Hag isn't it and Bournemouth away is tricky. I mean, we only won there last season 1-0 with a beautiful Casemiro goal and a, and a brilliant assist from Ericsson, two players that have dropped off massively this season. So it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. Sweeney says, bringing Nagelsmann and giving him very little pre-season would be naive and amateur from Sir Jim and the team. It's exactly what I was talking about there. Even though he's my number one choice, it's it's difficult to see how this summer wouldn't turn into a mess. Um Chikorito says, sell Ahmad and buy Elise with a limited budget. Yep, and he's got the palm emoji there. I would be keeping Ahmad, even though I think Elise is great. And I th honestly, I think he's great. When he came on for Palace, was it last weekend? Was it against, who was it against when he came on for Palace? Was it last weekend? Yeah, he made a cameo. He's just come back from injury and he was brilliant. Elise, I think he's top draw. But with the money we've got, and the positions we need, centre-backs, left-backs, you know, people talking about even a right-back, we'll get onto frame pog in a second. I think a CDM is crucial, absolutely crucial. And then you've got, you know, your striker as well. I'd be keeping Ahmad and, and, and not spending the money on Elise. Glenny says, Nagelsmann did well to be the buying manager at the age of 14, according to last night's show. <laughs> Kev's show is, is class and Kev's doing really well on the shows and they are a breath of fresh air. Got a lot, um, got a lot of banter in there. I enjoy relax, um, relaxing and just putting them on while I'm cooking my tea in the background. That's what I did last night. Spencer Silvertower, I've done that as well. So yeah, that's the talk of the new manager. Don't want to speak about it for the whole show. But that's where we're at and they're the options. And you decide what option you'd rather go down. At the moment, the poll in the chat is 
Eric Ten Hag, 75%. Julian Nagelsmann, 25%. That is a landslide. More of a landslide than what I thought it would be. You'd have your say. That's the talk on the manager for now. Any new updates, we will bring it to you. Next up, I want to talk about Jeremy Frimpong. Jeremy Frimpong, a right back or would you say a right wing back? A right wing back, nearly a right winger this season. He's absolutely tearing it up for Bayer Leverkusen. But do not get me wrong, he's basically playing as a right winger. That's what is basically happening. And by the way, anyone who thinks a back five is a pragmatic, boring style of football, you just need to watch um, Xavi's, Xavi Alonso's Bayer Leverkusen. They are brilliant to watch. Brilliant to watch. They play a back five, but they basically play three centre-backs and they push Grimaldo and Frimpong way high up the pitch. They're basically playing as wingers. It's beautiful to watch. It's great. I think whoever gets um, Javi Alonso as a manager in the future is going to be very lucky. I think he's an excellent up-and-coming manager. It's a shame he's ex-Liverpool, to be honest with you. But Leverkusen are doing great and Jeremy Frimpong's doing great as well. Frimpong has been on the radar since Eric Ten Hag's stepped into Manchester United. Even when Eric Ten Hag hadn't been officially confirmed for the job, in the January before Eric Ten Hag came in, there was already links to Frimpong because we basically knew Ten Hag was going to be manager and we knew Ten Hag really liked him. frimpong has been on Manchester United's scouting list for a while and he's also on Eric Ten Hag's list. He's highly up there. Also, he used to be at Manchester City's academy, so through the grapevine, you know people that have kind of been in contact with Jeremy Frimpong. I'm not saying me personally, but people around Manchester who you know. And it is no secret that he would love to come back to Manchester. He wants to come and play in the Premier League and he would love to come back to Manchester. Manchester United are very interested. It's a £34 million release clause, a €40 million Euro release clause. For a player of that calibre, it's an absolute bargain and that is avail active this summer. Frimpong will leave by Leverkusen this summer. I don't think there's any doubt about it that a club out there is going to pay £34 million to secure him. £34 million pounds because he's a top quality talent, he's young, he's fresh. My only issue with it is is a right back even though we've been wanting a right back for summers on end with all the positions that we need to fill is it the priority left back's kind of overtaken the right back in a priority for Manchester United also can he play in a back four in the Premier League I'm not sure with how attacking he is he's more of a right winger to be honest with you you'd be going for him instead of Elise obviously that's a joke but in a back four in the Premier League, the physicality of it, and when you look at his height as well, I think he's five foot seven, five foot eight. I know there's been small fullbacks that have worked in the Premier League, but it's a tough ask. It's a really tough ask, if I'm going to be honest with you. That's where I have my question marks, because is he an excellent player? Yes. Is he a huge young prospect? Absolutely. Is he one of the best wing backs in the world? Yeah, I would say so. But wing-back is definitely different to a right-back. And we're, we're playing a back four in the Premier League. Is he the right profile to go for? Because as well, looking at the report, so the, the report's coming out from Sport Build saying that Manchester United and Real Madrid have started planning for the upcoming summer transfer window. Well, we'd hope so. Um, they are both looking to reinforce their defence and have their eyes set on Bayer Leverkusen star Jeremy Frimpong. According to the report, both clubs have already established some sort of contact. The reason why Manchester United could be going for Jeremy Frimpong is because the future of Aaron Wambasaka isn't that certain. He could be on the move and Frimpong could be a great replacement. So, starting off on this is Wambasaka. The, the way we get Frimpong in, we sell Wambasaka. If Wambasaka leaves, Fringpong would come in. I would. I, that's that's what I'm assuming, and that's what I think would be would, would happen for Manchester United. It's 34 million pounds. You're gonna sell Warren Wambasaka. You need a replacement. That's how Fringpong comes in. If Wambasaka stays, Fringpong doesn't come to Manchester United. You're getting rid of somebody who is one of the best one-on-one -on -one defenders in Europe. By the way, I would move on Wambasaka. I would move on Wambasaka. I've said this multiple times. I know he's a lot of people in the chat are a big fan of him. I know that. My personal opinion, Dallo for me is levels above Wambasaka. Wambasaka is great one on one defending. He can lock down a winger. Everything else is he's just not up to par. Going forward, not good enough. 
technically on the football, not good enough. And you just need a more mod modern fullback in today's game to be at the top level. He's a good fullback. He's a very, very good defender in terms of one-on-one -on -one defending. Sometimes he can get caught on the back post, but one-on-one -on -one defending is a good defender. But for a top club, you know, Wan-Bissaka is not starting for a top club. That's what I'm saying. So wan I would want to move him on. Is Jeremy Frimborg the right profile to, to replace a wan though? Because you're replacing somebody who we have in our squad as a very good defensive right back with a hugely attacking right back who... Is he going to be solid defensively in the Premier League? I'm not sure. I've done a lot of research on Frimpong, actually, and I've watched him quite a lot. I do like him. A lot of people in the chat are saying they think he could work in a back four. I'm not too sure. But then again, you have players like Trent Alexander-Arnold that are very, very good going forward and aren't the best going backwards, but they make it work because you play to the player's strengths and you try to hide their weaknesses as much as possible. At Manchester United, we're always exposing players' weaknesses. A big example of that this season is Casemiro and we're not getting the best out of the strengths. So that's something that needs to change at Manchester United. But Jeremy Frimpong, would you want to go for him? Yes or no? Get in the chat what you think. The Nagelsmann, Eric Ten Hag poll, let's end that and do, would you replace wan with Jeremy Frimpong this summer? Let's get that poll going and see what you guys think about that. Um, Joe H says, our right back situation is not bad, so I'd rather buy a left back. Uh, Aaron Wampasaka is back at the back post. He can't keep possession and he's rash. I agree with that. I'm, I agree with that. I Possession-based football, um, playing out from the back like Ten Hag wants to do, Wampasaka isn't, isn't the guy for you. You saw against Liverpool, like, Anana had the ball, or, or Maguire had the ball. Liverpool just marked everybody else and left Wampasaka free because they knew. Like, he's not causing any th problems on that ball. And Anana and Maguire and whoever's at the back still didn't want to pass to him. He was open. I kept hearing people in the crowd saying, Wan-Bissaka's open. We still didn't pass to him because he's not go good on the football. He's not. Good one-on-one -on -one defending. I wouldn't mind if we kept him for another season because of the issues that we've got elsewhere. I don't think he's, like, a huge issue because Dallow is my starter and I, I actually have trust and faith in Dallow. And I think he's probably had the best season of his career and he's only on the up. Dallow's my first choice. So wan is, for me, only a second choice right back. I know he's had to play left back a few times this season. He's definitely not a left back. And left back's a situation we need to address. So it wouldn't be my first thought to go and replace wan this summer. But if we were going to do it, I do think it's something that needs addressing. Like, we do need to replace him eventually. But this is where we're at right now. We need a striker. We need a left back. We need a CDM. We need two centre-backs. I mean, right back really has kind of filtered down to it's filtered down to like sixth priority really and people would even say a right wing even seventh priority i'd actually say you know he's, he's down he's down there we have so many priorities at manchester united because we've been terrible in recruitment for so many years that right backs filtered right down there but if if man united feel like 34 million pound release cards for jeremy frimpong is too good to pass up on and they do go for him wan and wan departs. Is that the right move for Manchester United? Get in the comments and get in the poll. Would you replace wan with Frimpong this summer? I think Frimpong's an excellent player. Can he work in a back four in the Premier League? Get in the comments. I would s get in the poll what you think. I'm going to vote on that as well. Let me get some super chats in. God, the super chats are going missing. I can't find them. Let me get up here. So Michael Neal says, don't think Liverpool, City, Arsenal worry too much about defensive fullbacks. Need to build teams that can play in a system. I think that's an excellent point and it's an excellent super chat. And like what I just said there, for a top, top team, wan isn't isn't starting and he's not playing. He's not. We're unfortunately not a team that is establishing our system and building out from the back like, you know, a Liverpool, a City and an Arsenal. What do, what do them teams all have co in common? They have fullbacks that can invert into the midfield. They have fullbacks that are excellent going forward. And it's a huge strength to their build up play. You, know, you have Ben White with Arsenal, who has been exceptional this season. You have Trent, who, okay, yeah, going backwards, he's not the best. But for me, he's the best fullback probably in the Premier League just because of how good he is on the football and technically going forward. You have City, who. I mean, they have multiple different players who can play there. 
these this is what this is what top clubs have. They have fullbacks who can progress the football, and I think that's an excellent point by Michael Neal there. Duncania says, if we go for Nagelsmann, we'd have to completely rebuild the whole squad almost immediately since he plays a back f a five at the back and no wingers. Very expensive. Interesting, Duncania. Frimpon would work then for Julian Nagelsmann, wouldn't he? Frimpon would work in that system. Um, but just because Nagelsmann play, has played a back five before doesn't mean he'd do it in Manchester United, by the way. Like Ineos said, they want to they wanna set the style of play for Manchester United and the manager's got to follow it. That's what's been put out in the reports before. Obviously, not it's not going to be set down to a T of formations or anything like that, but they will tell the manager, the next manager, if they do get one, how they want Manchester United to be playing. And because they're going to invest in recruitment and if they do need to change the manager they want it to be a seamless transition maybe they would tell them what formation to play who knows uh joe tommy says that darlow is currently one of the best right backs in the world this season i don't get the hate around him neither do i Dallo unfortunately does have a mistake in him he's always had a mistake in him he's got better at it this season but there has been mistakes i remember copenhagen away there was a mistake i mean against chelsea that penalty was a bit of a mistake whether it would be a penalty or not he does have a mistake in him but overall as an overall consistent player and right back this season he has been absolutely top notch and I even have my my personal trainer that I've been working with is an Arsenal fan and he watches all the football like he's so into it and he's an Arsenal fan and he even said to me the other day he was like you know a player that I would actually even though Ben White's doing so well a player that I would that I think most teams would take from Manchester United would be Dallow. He said he, he's done so well this season so Dallow is my first choice right back it's just whether you move Aaron Wan-Bissaka on and does Frimpong come in? Does wan want to leave? And there's reports about him wanting about him going in the past. Would he want to leave? Do Man United want to sell him? And if they do, is Frimpong the right player to bring in for wan -Bissaka? Let's see how the poll is going. Would you replace wan with Frimpong this summer? Wow! This is another landslide that I didn't expect. 77% say yes and 23% say no. And I think there's a couple of reasons that this is the case. Frimpong is more exciting. Two, Frimpong is new toy. So everyone loves a new toy. Three, everyone loves a, a, a fullback that can score goals and get assists. And Frimpong can absolutely do that. I mean, his record this season is fantastic. Remember, he'll be playing in a different system for Manchester United if Eric Ten, if Eric Ten Hag is still the manager. You know, if it's Nagelsmann, you never know. He might play a back five and he might be in a similar sort of system. But... Also, with Frumpong as well, and 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 I think this is the case. I think people have understood that Wan Bissaka hasn't got a future at Manchester United if Manchester United are at a top top level. He's not the only player, and don't get me wrong. I like Wan Bissaka. I think he's a good squad player that has helped us out a lot. He's not a top level fullback, so he is going to have to get moved on eventually. So I think people have recognised that. But seventy seven percent say yes, they would replace Wan Bissaka with Frumpong this summer. Interesting stuff, everyone. Interesting stuff. Now, let move, let's move on to the next topic. Keep getting your votes in on that until we come up with the next poll that we're going to go with. What should be the next poll? Let me know in the comments what you think the next poll should be. I'm moving on to Ivan Tony. This is going to be interesting because this is a topic I massively disagree with Mark on. Brendan Arunha, welcome to the United Stand Members Club. So, Ivan Tony. Brentford expect the England striker Ivan Tony to leave the club in the summer, but the Bees would de demand £50 million. The report a couple of days ago, which took everyone by surprise, was from Pl uh, Pletty Goal, reliable journalist, that said, you know, Ivan Tony could be available for 35 to £40 million this summer, which I looked at that, I wrote a tweet instantly, and I said, are my eyes deceiving me? We have to go for him. I thought it'd be like £60 million at least. And even then, like anything 60 million, up to 60 million, I'm all over Ivan Tony. We absolutely need a player like that. I just thought it'd be a bit more expensive. Ivan Tony, it's got a year left on his deal. So did Mason Mount, and we ended up paying 60 million for him. But he has had the betting stuff in the past, which might take a bit of value away from him in terms of selling him for Brentford, which I think, obviously, it's not a good thing he's had, he's had the, the betting stuff. And you'd think, I think he's learnt from that and he's moved on. I can't say categorically it won't happen again, but you very much doubt it's going to happen again. So if that means that money's come off his price tag, okay, money's come off his price tag. For us, that's a good thing because we can't afford to be spending ridiculous amounts of money on a striker. It's now coming out that it looks like the price tag for Ivan Tony will be around £50 million. 
50 million pounds. It's a steal for someone like Ivan Tony. Honestly, I don't care. It's a steal. 50 million pounds. I think we have to go for it for that price. I think we have to go for it. And I can already see in the chat saying, we've got Hoyland, we don't need Tony, stay away from Tony. Mark's been, Mark's been, had his opinion and that's absolutely fine. I know that Mark's a huge fan of Rasmus, you know, I know that they're good mates, but I'm also a big fan of Rasmus. And I also think Rasmus is going to be a star striker for Manchester United in the future. Let's, let's have a conversation, everyone. Rasmus needs support. You cannot go into next season with only Rasmus Hoyland as your striker option. People are saying, you know, go for someone as an understudy to Rasmus. Why? We're Manchester United. You should have two top players competing in every position. Why would we go for somebody that can't compete with Rasmus Hoyland? We should have someone who can at least can compete, and Tony can absolutely do that. We need someone with experience. Tony t t checks that box. We need some... Ivan Tony also is bulletproof in terms of, in terms of risks. He's Premier League proven. He scores goals for Brentford, goals go off for Brentford. He's also great at integrating players into play. Premier League proven, it works. 50 million for a player of his quality, it's very, very, very hard to come by. We should be all over that deal. We should be. And if Rasmus is what we think he's going to be in terms of quality, in terms of what we think he's going to be, he'd be able to compete with Ivan Tony anyway. If Ivan Tony's just going to bench Hoyland for the, for, for, for the whole season, which I don't think would happen, I think they'd definitely share game time, then that's, we want someone who's at least as good as Ivan Tony playing up front for Manchester United. You want top quality. Like, you'd want someone who, who can compete with, with Rasmus. You want, you want Rasmus to be able to come in and, and, bench, and, and bench Tony for a few games because he's done so good. And if Rasmus is of the quality that we think he is, you know, we should be able to compete with someone like Ivan Tony. I, we need two top strikers. You look at Callum Wilson and Isaac for Newcastle. You look at Alvarez and Haaland for Manchester City. That's what we need to be like. A striker is super important. And people can say to me, yeah, but Ivan Tony won't get chances the same way Rasmus doesn't get chances. I'm not saying that he will start getting loads of chances, Ivan Tony. I'm not saying that. But we need two top quality strikers. Ra Rashford can't be starting as striker. Also, what Tony does is he offers something a bit different. He's someone who is great. He's a nightmare for defenders. He's a nightmare for defenders. He's great at ruffling feathers. His hold-up play is actually very, very good. He's great at bringing other players into play as well. His link-up play is good. He's got an all-round game. He runs the channels well. He's set-piece threat. He's massive off set-pieces, not only just from corners and, and free kicks, but he can also take the free kicks. He can take the penalties. His set-piece record is great. He's an absolutely great player to have in your armour. And honestly, I think the talk of Mark saying we still shouldn't go near Ivan Tony for 40 million. Are you, it's, he's mental to me. Like, why would you pass up on that opportunity? I, I, it's crazy to me. He's such a top quality striker. I mean, everyone can have their own opinions. I just massively don't agree with it. He's such a top quality striker. Also, Rasmus is 21. 21. Ivan Tony's 28, right? It's perfect. You have Ivan Tony. What, until he's like 32? That's four years. Even then, when Ivan Tony's 32 and you've got like the best out of him, Rasmus is still only 25. He's literally starting to come into his prime and he's learnt off Ivan Tony, who's had, you know, an up and down career, played in all different levels of football, took the Premier League by storm when he came up by, with Brentford. He's an England international that I think probably should go to the Euros as well with how he played in, in the last set of friendlies. Like, for me, it's a no-brainer. And do you know what else gets me is Mark says, oh, I would go for Ollie Watkins, though. Ollie Watkins is way more ex would be way more expensive than Ivan Tony. And for me, I I Ollie Watkins is a great player, but he's still a player that's going to massively compete with Hoyland the same way Tony would. So I don't get the logic. Why would you not go for Tony, but you'd go for Watkins? I don't get it because I get Watkins as link-up player, but so does Ivan Tony. But... We need to go for someone, I think, we're well, Manchester United, we need to be competitive. Think about the days where we had Sheringham, Solskjaer, York and Cole. We need someone in there who, God forbid Rasmus is injured, is good enough to play for Manchester United. The last thing you want next season is if Rasmus has picked up an injury or he's not available to play, you're looking at the bench thinking, 
it's just not as good. The option isn't as good. You want quality across the board at all times. That's why you need someone who's going to be able to compete, in my opinion. Um, anyway, get in the comments what you think, because, you know, it's starting to feel like the days are gone where we have a competitive squad. We need a competitive squad. And me saying I want Tony doesn't mean I don't want Hoyland. I love Rasmus. I think he's excellent. I'm so glad we signed him. You need two competing. But let's get another poll in. Um, get the producer on that in a second. Let's get a poll saying is, should we go for Ivan Tony this summer for £50 million? I want to know what you guys think. I want to know what you guys think on that one. Um, got a couple of super chats in. Brad Muffin says, Ivan Tony is toxic, stay away. Is interesting that because we did an interview with Brentford's technical director on the build-up show and he said that Ivan Tony is one of the best professionals any he start for any club in the world. He's brilliant around the place. And Thomas Frank, coincidentally, also has him as Brentford captain. So he can't be that toxic if he's Brentford captain. He's made a mistake with the betting stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. But what else makes you think he's toxic? Oh, we said in a few interviews he wants to move to a different club. Yeah, I know he, he, he wants to move. Is it Brentford? No disrespect to Brentford. But for me, that's... OK, maybe he could be a bit more respectful, but he's he's a better player than Brentford. He's ambitious. He wants to do something with his career. He's played across all the top leagues. And do you know what? To make it as a Manchester United player sometimes, you've got to have a bit of arrogance. You've got to have a bit of arrogance about you. People were absolutely applauding it when Martinez went and knocked on Ajax's door and was like, I want to go to Manchester United. Um, and rung up Ten Hag and was like, you know, Arsenal want me, but if you want me at United, I'll go. People were pl applauding it when Anthony was saying, you know, knocking on to, to the Ajax saying, I'm going, I'm leaving, I want Manchester United. But Ivan Tony says he wants to play at a bigger club and people are saying that's toxic. I want someone who's desperate to play for Man United. I want someone who has the confidence in their own ability that they're going to be able to smash it for Man United. And Ivan Tony has that bit of arrogance. You need that. Cantona had it. Cantona had that bit of arrogance and personality about him. I'm not comparing Tony to, to Cantona, but you need someone with that sort of personality. Rasmus has belief in his own abilities. Like, you need someone like that. So, for me, it's just like people saying he's toxic. What, because he said he wants to leave Brentford? He, he probably does want to leave Brentford, yeah. He probably does. Declan Rice wanted to leave West Ham and go on to Arsenal because players want to play at top clubs. Um, that's the way it is, um, and I want someone who wants to play for us. He's desperate to play for a top club, Def desperate to prove himself at the top level. Also, I saw something, an interview that he did as well, where the year, the year before, obviously, he got banned through betting, through the betting stuff, he went through all of his chances. And he said he went through all of the chances that he'd missed and examined what he could have done better to finish them chances because he was not that far off Kane's record. And if he would have done that better, he would have been able to get Kane's record. I mean, to be to be that kind of ambitious, that's another massive tick in the box for me. But we're going to get a poll. Would you get Ivan Tony and get in the comments down below? It's like people always say that me and Mark, you know, I always say what exactly what Mark says, and that's just not true. We do agree on a lot of things, but we disagree on stuff too. De Gea was another one of them that we had a disagreement on, and we can argue it, we can debate it, and it's respectful, obviously, but when I'm on my show, I'm going to have my say, because I think it'd be a huge mistake to miss out on, on this opportunity, if I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, Michael Neal says, need a different profile of striker than Tony, one that can fill in elsewhere, also don't underestimate the power of addiction. Um, obviously, the, the, the betting stuff is something you've got to take into account. Absolutely, you've got to take it into account, but I still think I would still take that risk and go for him. And a lot of people say need a different profile of striker than Tony. I understand that point, Michael. I do understand that point. I think a lot of people think we need someone who can also, you know, play across the front three, someone who can facilitate the wingers if we are going to play with wingers like Rashford and Garnacho because they're very direct and they're not the type of wingers that are necessarily always going to be looking for a striker and a, a kind of a false nine type striker or that sort of agile striker that can can facilitate wingers like that that's why Martial works works so well with Greenwood and Rashford when they played and Martial was excellent in there because Martial was a little bit of a facilitator that's why F Firmino was absolutely crucial for Jurgen Klopp with Sané uh, we're well not Sané with Mane and Salah because 
he facilitated them two wingers. The wingers were the main threats, the main goal scorers. So it just depends, depends which way Man United want to play. Do they want to play with a target man like a Tony and Erasmus and have crosses into the box? Or do they want to play with Rashford and Ganacho being your main goal outlets and play with a facilitating number nine? That's the question you've got to ask yourself. I think you can do a little bit of both. I think you can have one really direct winger, you can have one really creative winger, but we've got to get the balance right. And I think the striker should be able to do both as well. I think Rasmus's hold-up play is improving. I think he can facilitate, but he also he's great in the box. And I think Ivan Tony, when we spoke to Brentford's technical director, he's great at bringing other players into play. I saw it when he played for England. His link-up play is excellent. He does look for players to, to, to pass in. I mean, for the goal that Brentford scored against us to equalise when Mason Mount had scored recently, which is an absolute dagger, Ivan Tony turned Martinez and got the ball into the box for it to, you know, be scored. So that's kind of the stuff he can do as well. He can facilitate as well as be a target man. Uh, get in the comments what you think. International2675 says, what's more player FC than not getting Tony because of Rasmus? Interesting point, interesting point. The fact of the matter is, if, if people don't want Tony because they're scared he's going to bench Rasmus, what does that say to you? We should be having the best of the best. Rasmus can compete with, with Tony and he can also learn from Tony. You know, you've got to have the best playing in, your, in, 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 the, in different positions for Manchester United. And, and that's something I'll stand by no matter who it is. Um, Ganacho is a facilitator too, says Bolver, especially when he's playing on the right wing. Uh, we've got more chats coming. I'm trying to get good ones in here. We have Lukeman says, Ivan Tony is a better striker than Watkins. If you know football, you should know this. Forget this season. Watkins has been excellent this season, but I think obviously he's done the work himself. But I think Unai Emery is absolutely huge in that, you know, teaching him how to... He's been showing him clips of Cavani. He's been teaching him massive stuff. Like, I remember Watkins. I used to always think he was a good player. I never thought he was a great player. This season, he's been a great player. And, and Unai Emery's done an excellent job with him. When it comes to just absolute technicality and striking ability, I think Tony's better. I think Tony's better, personally. Watkins has had a better season, but I think Tony is better. Uh, but but Watkins is done excellently, and I think he's progressed brilliantly under Unai Emery. And he's he's a player I'd also take at Manchester United, but there's absolutely zero chance on this earth. But also a bit of news coming in from the Ivan Tony story as well, because obviously he was linked to Arsenal a lot. He said the recent good form of Arsenal's German forward Kai Havertz has made the Gunners rethink their summer transfer plans with a move for Tony now unlikely. I mean, I think Arsenal, if they don't go for a striker, it would be silly from them. I think they have to go for a striker, but this isn't AFTV. Uh, I think they have to, despite anyone's good form. But if they don't go, don't go, don't go for Tony, maybe it is because they're worried about the the mentality in terms of you know the betting issues that he's had in the past, and you can understand that. But. This is how I know a player's good. I was sat here a few months ago thinking, oh my gosh, if Arsenal get Tony, like it's over. Like they're going to be smashing it. They're already smashing it as it is, having someone like Tony in there as well. So for them not to go for Tony, I think that's a, it's an advantage to, to teams around them. But, you know, they might go and get a Vlavic. They might go and get an Osman. Who knows? You know, they might go and get someone who's top quality as well. Uh, Lavisha says, get Xerxy. Xerxy looks a good up and coming talent, but it's going to be around 70, 75 million for Xerxy, apparently. They want a, they want a fee similar to Rasmus because Xerxy's in kind of in the same place where he's unproven, but he's got a lot of bags of potential and they've seen if you can get around 70 million for Rasmus, they want that for Xerxy. We're not spending 70 million on an unproven player, even though he has got good attributes and he looks like he's got a lot of potential. We're just not... Especially if Ivan Tony's there for 40, 50 million, who's proven and he's Premier League proven and can smash it for you in the Prem. Like, we're just not going to do that. Um, I think we need someone with a bit of experience as well, I'm going to be honest. Make sure you smash a like on the video. Um, Ivan Tony, 50 million this summer, yes or no? Getting your chat, getting, get your vote in the poll. I'm going to say yes, obviously. Have I convinced you? Do you know what? It's better than it was the other day when Mark did it. 
we're on 40%, 47% yes and 53% no. 47% yes and 53% no. So, you know what? We're getting there. I feel like I'm going to convince you all. I'm going to convince you all by the start of the summer transfer window. I don't think we will go for Tony, by the way, but I think we have to. For 50 million, I think it's a great price, especially considering what strikers are going for nowadays. 53% no, 47% yes. I'll take that for now. We're going to get it over 50% in the upcoming weeks. We're going to get it there. We're going to get it there. I'm going to, I'm going to get you guys on my side. Uh, and a lot of people saying Zerks, he looks like he's going to Milan. Yeah, he does. He does look like he's going to Milan as well. Going to Milan as well. Um, Orca's rule says Paul, Tony 50 mil, Sesco 40 mil, or Ferguson 100 mil. I mean, I, we could get that going. We could definitely get that going um, for you. And Stephen Morocco says, You've actually convinced me not to go for him. Excuse me, how, how have I done that? Please elaborate. Or are you just having me on on this Friday, Friday morning? And Oleg says, I mean, we need to pay max 40 million for a striker. I mean, I'm not going to say no to an extra 10 million for someone who is elite and can come in and smash it straight away. But each to their own, each to their own. Lukeman says, we have to go for him. Um, we should, we need him if we are a serious club. Uh, Nickel says, Xerxes or Sesco over Tony. Nickel, interesting why you would do that. Why would you go for Xerxes or Sesco over Tony? I'd be interested to know on the why. Because, you know, Tony's Premier League proven would instantly work. Sesco and Xerxes, even though they're young and have a big future ahead of them, like, you don't know it's definitely going to work. And we need someone who we know is definitely going to work. But I'd be interested to know the whys behind it. Is it because of the age? Probably it's because of the age. Next up to talk about is Ahmad exit. So, Ahmad is tipped for an exit. His career just isn't progressing at the speed that he'd hoped at this stage. And United's depth and attack means the situation is unlikely to change significantly next season. And this is coming from MEN reporter Stephen Railston. He said, nobody would blame Ahmad for pushing for a move away this summer. And in truth, that seems like the best option for him because he's played just 98 minutes since his return from injury. Although he might not be good enough to currently start for United, his potential is obvious and that will only be unlocked by starting games regularly. And that is, that I think all of that I agree with. I think he could be starting games regularly for United, though I do think from what I've, what I've seen in that Liverpool game, I don't see why not considering how our other performance have been this season. Also, Ahmad is, looks like he's set to be on his travels once the curtains are brought down for the campaign. So, I actually don't think we have that much of great depth in attack. I think we have a lot of depth, but I don't think any of it is really great. I think Garnacho has been our standout performer this season. As a forward player, he's been our biggest threat. Hoyland's looked really good in spells and he's suffered from lack of service. Of course he has, but he definitely looks like he's got a lot of potential. Rashford's underperformed. Anthony's underperformed. So Ahmad should have had, I mean, Sancho left the January transfer window. Ahmad should have had more of a chance. He's only played 98 minutes since his return from injury. I mean, that's just a disgrace. And for me, after his cameo against Liverpool, like he's like Ten Hag just completely forgot. He came on and not only did he score the winning goal, that was excellent. He had a great cameo. He was winning the ball back. He was keeping the ball well. I'm confused why he hasn't got a minute. I'm really confused why he hasn't got a minute. I really am. So... If Ahmad decides to leave, I'd understand. I don't want him to leave, but I'd completely understand. If Neil Guzman comes in, takes a look at him, he might end up staying. But he also might leave as well. He might do a, he might do a, you know, one of them where it's like, I've decided I'm going to leave. It doesn't matter who the manager is. I've decided I'm going to leave. I'm not getting the game time I want. We know he loves United. I think he's professionalism is excellent. You can tell he's very well liked within the squad. I would love for him to get given a chance. And I think that's one thing that Ten Hag is really upsetting the fan base on, that he's not. And I understand Ten Hag sees training every day. Ten Hag sees more than we do, but we've seen glimpses of him. We really like him. I'd love to see him get more of a chance, to be honest with you. How much would you get for Ahmad, though, if he did leave? That's the question. How much would you get for him? God, I, I just hope it's not one of, you know, an Alanga again where we get rid of him for 15 mil, but realistically, you could have get, got way more money for him. I still think it was the right decision to move on Alanga, by the way, contrary to 
people disagreeing with that. I still think it was the right decision. I just think we could have got more money for him. Last thing I wanted to speak about quickly. So quick Ashworth update. Sir Jim has held face to face talks with Newcastle owner Amanda Staveley in an attempt to reach an agreement with sporting director Dan Ashworth's move to Man United. So we know about that. You know, Sir Jim's still doing the best he can to get Dan Ashworth in as quick as quick as possible. It's looking like really hard work. Won't be in time for the summer, we don't think. So that's frustrating, but it is what it is. We spoke about that before. Michael Neal says, Ahmad was dreadful at Rangers. Ten Hag has shown he will pick youth if good enough. He dropped Anthony for Garnacho. Michael, I think that's a really good point. A really good point in the set that Ten Hag has shown he will pick youth if, if they are good enough. But just because Ahmad didn't have a success story at Rangers, he did brilliantly at Sunderland. And this season, I think he's earned at least an opportunity. I'm not saying he should be starting every game. I'm not saying, saying he should be a consistent starter, but I think he should at least earned an opportunity for some more minutes. Like, not only is he not starting games, which, you know, you can understand. I'm not saying he should start every game, but he's literally getting nothing off the bench, even though I think he's earned it through his cameos this season. So the Ahmad one is a weird one for me. I think he definitely deserves more minutes. But like you said, Ten Hag has given youth a chance. He has done that. So... It's a strange one. The Ahmad case is a strange one. Now, the last thing, oh, I mean, to be fair, actually, I might wrap up the show. Next show, I'll bring up the next thing I wanted to talk about. It's interesting. It's on Bramthwaite and Anana from Everton. I'll bring it up in my next show because we have done the hour now and don't want to go on too long. God, I could have kept going. Could have kept going for another hour this morning. I'm sure maybe not everyone would want me to do that, but I've got something else I want to bring in. I'll do that on my next show because it's not, it's not time it's not time it's not time dependent so i can bring it up on the next show but look everyone great show great interactive polls good back and forth as a community we can agree we can disagree that's what it's all about and got a lot of stuff off my chest this morning and had a great time speaking to you guys in the chat as well last but not least please hit a like on the video on your way out we would really appreciate it it's friday you've got the presser Bournemouth presser, huge for Ten Hag, absolutely huge. Tough game, Bournemouth away, but he has to win it. He has to win it. Headlines will be going crazy if he doesn't in terms of a new manager. That might be the nail in the coffin, who knows. Also, you've got Mark's 8pm show coming up later, which is always a good time. Have a lovely Friday, everyone. We've got football at the weekend. Hopefully Man United can uh, can brighten our weekend for us and not, and not dampen it. We've got the presser coming up in the afternoon. A lot to look forward to. Have a lovely day and we'll see you on the next one.